All right, everyone. So today I'm going to do the video for environmental toxicology. And I'm hoping that the video will work. I was literally sitting out here talking to the computer for like a full 30 minutes before I realized that it stopped recording. So I guess my dog's a lot smarter now. I guess. I don't know. So anyways, this topic is about environmental toxicology, or this whole PowerPoint is. But I'm going to divide this video into two parts. So part one is going to focus on the first probably 15 slides or so. And then the next video will focus on the next 15 slides. I found that if I split it in half, then probably, hopefully, more people will actually watch it. Because I know a lot of you don't want to watch a 30-minute video of me talking. I know I am very interesting, but even I don't think I want to watch a 30-minute video. So anyways, let's go and present this. And I'm going to check periodically to make sure that it's actually presenting. Because if it isn't, I'm going to be very upset and very angry. All right, so let's talk about environmental toxicology. All right, so there are so many risks in such little time. And also, if you've noticed, I've made a scenery change. I'm outside now. It's supposed to be 85 today, which is actually pretty nice. Um, so if you hear, you know, like a dog barking, it's probably my dog. Uh, if you hear some road traffic, sorry about that. Uh, so anyways, let's make sure that this is still recording. Yes, excellent. All right, so let's talk about so many risks in such little time. So in the last video, I was talking about how we have so many risks, like biological risks. So every day we are encountering tons of stuff, like we're encountering fungus, we're encountering bacteria, uh, viruses, you know, like the flu virus or maybe a virus known as COVID-19. But anyways, so anyways, since there are so many biological risks, we have to also consider that there are chemical risks. So every day when you're outside, you know, you are um, interacting with each other. Um, there's all kinds of risks. So back in the 1960s, people were really concerned with chemical risks. And uh, Rachel Carson in her book, Silent Spring, really brought toxic chemicals to the forefront of everyone's minds. They said, okay, we're breathing in this air, we're drinking this water, but are we slowly poisoning ourselves? So that's when uh, toxicology kind of, um, it's been around for a long time, but that's when it kind of came to the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, toxicology is basically the study of, of all these chemical compounds and then their effects on nature and living organisms. Um, back in the day, when DDT was like a really popular thing, you know, to spray for mosquitoes and stuff, uh, all the bald eagles started dying. And the reason that bald eagles started dying were was because they were exposed to so much DDT that whenever they tried to incubate their eggs, like whenever they tried to sit on them to warm them and stuff like that, the eggs would just crack. And then they would basically sit on their babies and it would kill them. So anyways, uh, any chemical can have uh, two different types of effects. One, it could be uh, an acute effect. You know, it's not like acute effect. It's like, you know, short-term effect. And they're also chronic, which are, you know, long-term kind of things. All right, so let's talk about uh, toxic chemicals and how we can evaluate, you know, how toxic are they? So literally anything can be toxic. Um, if you're talking about... Uh, you know, water. Water can be toxic if you drink too much of it. I mean, your body's not going to allow you to drink as much of it so that it'll kill you. But anyways, this guy named Paracelsus once said, anything can be a poison. The dose makes the poison. And the dose is going to be the concentration that you're exposed to. So for example, you could be exposed to some chemical right now. You could be breathing it in. Which makes me think about that radioactive song by Imagine Dragons. I won't sing it because, you know, I'm terrible at singing, but from breathing in the chemicals. <gasps> so anyways, any synthetic or natural chemical has the potential to cause harm if the concentration or the dose is high enough. So most of the times, uh, the dose is going to be measured in milligrams per liter or milligrams, micrograms, nanograms. Um, milligrams is probably the one that you are most familiar with if you've ever taken like Advil or Tylenol or you know some sort of uh, antibiotics or something so how do we determine how toxic chemical is 
uh, what you're going to do is, is you are going to basically perform these things called bioassay responses. So what you do is, is you take like a, a number of like lab rats or fish, shrimp, and you put them into a tank or into like a terrarium or something, and you have one group that has, you know, zero concentration, and they're not exposed to anything. Then you have like one milligram, five milligrams, ten milligrams, and you see how, what percentage of those, those die. So the end effect could be death, it could be uh, changes in behavior, it could be really anything, but most of the time it is death. All right, so what are you going to do to perform this thing called a bioassay? So a bioassay is where you take um, like a group of animals or plants. Um, most of the time it's going to be rats. Um, so what you do is you have a control group that are in one terrarium or in one area. They don't get any dose. They're just the normal rats, and all of the other conditions are exactly the same. Then in the next one, you give all of the rats like one milligram per liter through the air or through their water or through their food, or maybe you're even going to give it to them uh, intravenously, like you're going to inject them with it. And let's say there's 10 of those in there, you calculate the percentage that die at 1%. And then you keep increasing the concentration with the same number of rats until eventually you're going to get some sort of like giant concentration like... 10 or 20 that basically just kills everything um, so you give them exposure on the first day and then at the end of the study you usually get to decide as a scientist how long you're gonna make the you know how is it gonna be a short one is it gonna be one to two days or is it gonna be what they would call a chronic study or is it gonna be over a couple of months so you should also have a control group so on the AP exam they love to ding people for not having a control group so a control group is one that doesn't get anything they don't get any of the the concentration of the chemical their dosage is going to be zero so in theory zero percent of them should die all right so let's talk about dose response studies all right so dose response studies there are two different types one there are acute studies and the next one, there are chronic studies. Most of the time, the end result is death. You're trying to calculate, count how many individuals die after exposure to each concentration. So again, you're going to have the first group, which is the control group. They don't get any of the chemical. They have no dose, or their dosage is equal to zero. Then you have a group of individuals. Let's say you have 10 uh, brine shrimp, and brine shrimp are just these little tiny like crustacean things. And you expose them to, let's say... 0 0.01 milligrams per liter in their water. And then in the next one, you have 10 brine shrimp again, and you expose them to 0.1, and you just increase the concentration until you find a concentration that, that basically kills all of them. Uh, most of the time, the uh, end result is, is death, so you're trying to see what concentration is going to kill all of them. Uh, and then you, you graph the concentration or the percentage of people that or not people, but the percentage of organisms that die at each concentration. And usually it makes this thing called an S-shaped curve or a dose response curve. So in a dose response curve at low dosages like 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, not a lot of them are going to die. So as you know, none of them die, as you increase the concentration, you will get to a, a, a point where it starts to kill you know, a lot of them. And then at the really high dosage, almost all of them are going to die. Maybe you'll have 1 out of 10 that survive. All right? So let's talk about dose response studies and some, uh, some vocab words that are they're basically associated with dose response studies. So you may see a question that says, um, what, around what concentration is the threshold, threshold dosage? And the threshold dosage is going to be the one where you first start to see a response. So let's say that on this graph here, and I'll move the graph in a second, down here at the very bottom, you literally have no individuals dying. So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And then around like a, a 3, a concentration of around 3, you're going to start to have some individuals that die. So I would say that the threshold dosage for this chemical, whatever it is, is going to be around 3 and whatever the units are for the dosage. The dosage that kills 50% of the individuals is called the LD50, or the lethal dosage that kills 50% of the individuals. So the LD50 uh, is usually what they will give you. You can Google the LD50 for literally any chemical that you want. 
Um, all chemicals should have an LD50. So, for example, water has an LD50. Caffeine has an LD50. Literally any chemical is going to have an LD50. You can also have this thing called an LC50. Wow, it's really windy. And it came out of nowhere. So anyways, an LC50 is going to be the lethal concentration that kills 50% or basically, yeah, it kills 50% of the population. So the only difference is the dosage and the concentration. The concentration is usually like what you're giving them. The dose is actually what they're you know receiving. So for example, you may be giving them 50 milligrams of some chemical, so that would be the concentration. But the dosage that they're actually receiving is probably less than that because their body is metabolizing some of it, not metabolizing some of it. So there is a slight difference between dosage and concentration. So dosage that causes 50% of the individuals to show an unexpected behavior, I mean to show the expected behavior, is what you would call the ED50 or the effective dose for 50% of the population. So what are you trying to see? If your end result is not to see if they die or not, then what sort of behavior are you looking for? So for example, in uh, bass, they started a, a dosage study where they dosed bass, which is a type of fish, with uh, floxetine, which is also known as Prozac. So Prozac is an antidepressant used, it's a selective serotonin and reuptake inhibitor. It's or an SSRI, and it's used to treat depression in, in humans. So what they did was they added the floxetine into the water, and then they tried to observe what concentration made the, the bass basically stop eating or, you know, disregard their prey. When I say disregard their prey, they would just drop the, you know, like some fish in for the bass to eat, and the bass would just, like, hang out. They didn't even notice their prey anymore. So then they stopped eating, and then it killed them. So you would probably, like, that's an effective dose kind of thing. Like, you see what's the lowest dosage that, or the dosage that caused 50% of them to stop noticing their prey. All right, so here is another, uh, basically another curve that's going to show you, uh, you know, the LD50 and all kinds of stuff. And on one of the graphing activities, you'll actually make one of these. All right, so let's talk about some common LD50 values. All right, so here's some common LD50s, and uh, this chart is showing you the most toxic things or some common things that are toxic. All right, so one thing to keep in mind, and they love to ask this question on the AP exam or in our free response question, is the lower the LD50, the more lethal the chemical is or the worse it is for you. So let's say that something is in nanograms and that's the LD50, that substance is extremely, extremely, extremely toxic because nanograms is 10 to the negative 9. Um, usually it's measured in milligrams per kilogram. So for example, if you wanted to see like how much of this would kill 50% of the population, you would have to convert your weight in pounds into kilograms because, you know, Americans, we want to be different. We don't want to use the metric system. So then you would multiply your mass in kilograms by the LD50 and that would basically tell you how much it would take to kill you or to kill 50% of the population. Maybe you're part of the 50% that it's not going to kill. All right, so this uh, is some common LD50 values. So like I was saying, this botulinum toxin, it's basically a toxin that uh, is sometimes in canned foods. Um, it's basically going to... Uh... All right, so... Uh, Let's talk about how you could calculate the amount that is going to kill you, basically. So it says the average cup of kava V, it seems like a typo, anyways, contains 90 milligrams of caffeine. How many cups of coffee would you estimate that it would take to kill an average human of your size? So what you're going to do is, is you're going to convert your weight to kilograms. So to do that, you're going to take your weight, you don't have to do this, I'm just telling you how you would do it in case you might see it on a test or a quiz or something like that, maybe even some uh, practice FRQ questions. Interesting. Anywho, convert your weight into kilograms, and then what you would do is you would multiply your mass in kilograms by the LD50, and when I say LD50, it has to give you the LD50 up here. So the LD50 for caffeine is going to be 192 milligrams per kilogram. All right, so then for step two, you multiply those two together, and that will give you the milligrams of caffeine that it would take to kill you.
And then if you do the milligrams of caffeine that you got from here divided by how many milligrams are in one cup of coffee, that will tell you how many cups of coffee it would take to kill you. And I think the answer for this one for me is a ton of cups. It's like 700 of them. And uh, like I was saying earlier, your body, as you consume too much of something, like you keep drinking too much of something, your body will cause you to throw up. All right, so here are some common uh, lethal substances. So the first one is called botulin or the botulism toxin. Uh, it's extremely toxic, and what it does is, is it basically causes a botulism, which is where it starts to uh, basically paralyze you. So some of you will maybe hopefully notice that botulin, botulism toxin, botulism toxin shortens to Botox. So Botox is basically you're taking this botulism toxin and you're injecting it into your face so that you can paralyze some of the muscles in your face. So that you constantly look young, right? I'm looking at you, real housewives. So, anyways, it's uh, you get it from eating uh, food that's in cans that has not been canned properly. So, a couple of years ago, a lot of people got this from eating canned chili. Yeah, why are you eating canned chili? No idea. But, anyways, a lot of people got canned uh, or got botulism from eating canned chili. The next one that is extremely toxic is this thing called uh, aflatoxin. And aflatoxin is caused by uh, this uh, fungus or a mold that's found on peanuts. So what happens is, is let's say that you're uh, shipping some uh, peanuts or maybe you work at Texas Roadhouse and the box got kind of wet and then some mold started growing on the peanuts. Yikes, yeah. You're going to get aflatoxin. And it is extremely toxic and it'll most likely give you cancer. Cyanide is probably one that you've heard of before. So cyanide is really, really, really toxic. It's found naturally in uh, like cherry trees and cherry tree leaves, um, apricots and stuff like that. It's also found in buckeyes. So if you're eating buckeyes like the Ohio State mascot, I don't know why you would be eating that, but whatever. If you're eating that, you're probably getting a tiny little dose of cyanide. Uh, almonds also have a small amount of cyanide in them as well. Uh, so cyanide is one of the, the few primary poisons. So when I say primary poison, it literally affects your uh, ability to breathe. And it kills you pretty quick. Uh, vitamin D. Vitamin D is uh, an essential vitamin. And whenever you're outside in the sun, uh, I'm kind of out in the sun right now. I don't get out in the sun that often, though, just because I burn so easily. So anyways, whenever you're out inside in the sun, your skin naturally makes vitamin D. Um, your skin plus UV light equals vitamin D. But a lot of people are uh, vitamin D deficient because they don't ever go outside. So if you work in an office building for, you know, 8 to 10 hours a day, a lot of people are vitamin D deficient. So they take vitamin D in order to supplement that. But then some people take too much of it, and it's not a... Uh, water-soluble vitamin like vitamin C. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, and therefore it'll build up in your system, and it, it really can, can kill you. All right, so here's some factors that determine concentration. And so there are multiple things that can determine how much are you exposed to kind of thing. So the first way is through uh, intravenous injection, and that's the, the worst way to get something. So if you are going to be exposed to something, you probably don't want to have someone injected directly into your, your bloodstream because your liver is not going to be able to uh, detoxify or anything like that. So the next worst way is to breathe it in. So you have tons of like all these little hairs and cilia inside your nose and inside your lungs. But whenever we talk about particulates and stuff like that, particulates, some of them are so tiny that they just pass right through and they embed themselves in your lungs. Um, drinking or eating it is probably, I want to say, the best way. And when I say the best way, uh, mainly because as you, as your body tries to detoxify it, your liver is really going to um, do this thing called the first pass effect. And it's where you're, as you eat it or as you drink something, then it goes through your, your stomach, through your liver, and it detoxifies it before it reaches your circulatory system. All right, so here's some other factors that can determine the concentration that you are exposed to. So the solubility is another really big issue. So how easily does it dissolve in water? So things that are really water-soluble, they are really kind of unav unavoidable. 
because everything that you drink has some sort of water in it. Even if you think about like soda, soda has some sort of water in it. And fat soluble things, uh, fat soluble chemicals usually are going to be stored up in your fat cells or your adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is just a fancy way of saying uh, fat or fat tissue. And then the last thing is persistence. How long does it stay in the environment? So there are these things called persistent organic pollutants or POPs and they have most of them have been outlawed so they're things like DDT, PCBs and they stay in the environment for just a really really long time and you can be exposed to them for a really long extended period of time. Alright and then finally we've got these two concepts called biomagnification and bioaccumulation so I'm going to basically talk about these two and then I'll show you the the you know, text definition. So bioaccumulation is going to be whenever you eat something like a plant or something or maybe some, some fish and then the concentration inside your body increases. So you just start accumulating this toxin inside your body. Biomagnification on the other hand is whenever something eats you or, or eats something from a lower trophic level. Look at me using vocabulary words. So for example in this picture, this little guy here, maybe he's eating all kinds of phytoplankton and they've got a small dose of mercury in them. So he's accumulating mercury in his body. Well then this fish here, he eats a ton of these little guys, so he has a ton of mercury in him. And then this big guy over here, he eats a ton of these guys. So then he gets like a whopping dose, and that's, that's literally the phrase your textbook uses, a whopping dose of this. So uh, this guy is going to have what you call biomagnification, and it's just an increase in concentration of something as it moves up the food chain. So here are the two definitions, the two words for those, and they're, they're basically what I was just talking about. And remember again, adipose tissue is just fat tissue. Alright, so I think that is the last one that I want to cover today. So I'll pick up there tomorrow. Thanks for watching.